it, it, there's so there's there's all that. It's very emotional, and I think people that don't understand hunting don't understand that. Where it's we're not just out there just for blood, guts, and glory. It we're we're feeding our families. It, it's important to us, and, and we honor that animal. We, we respect it, and we don't want it to suffer. It's you know why we why we prepare the way we prepare to you know to get out there. Oh, you got her, dude. She's down. Let's go. Dude, I just shot a deer of a lifetime. Freaking smoked him. Born with nature, and if you're a believer, born with God. Definitely gets your heart pumping. Boy, you are in trouble. Oh, Obsession Podcast. What's up, folks? My name is Sam Thrash. I'm your Fall Obsession Podcast host, back for another Monday morning episode with you guys. Our podcast is driven by Ridge Rock Hunt Company and our friends over there, and I'll talk more about them uh, toward the end of our episode here. Joining me this week, we have a new guest on our podcast, uh, actually a lady from one of our newest partners here at Fall Obsession, Raylene Proto from Detali Outdoors. Welcome to the podcast, Raylene. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, so your your company, and, and I know we've gotten to know each other a little bit and, and learn about the brand mm-hmm. and everything here recently, but your your company is new in the industry, um, or relatively so. Yes. So the perfect, and I, I told you this just a few minutes ago, the perfect icebreaker is tell us not only who you guys are, but where this name came from. Um, so uh, Detali actually came from um, my great grandmother. Uh, we're Sicilian, so it's actually her maiden name. Um, and she was a really interesting woman. She was a foundling, um, which is mainly that means like you're given up for adoption. So there's kind of a long story that goes with that. Um, but she survived like the Mencia earthquake in Sicily, um, and she had a twin brother who did not survive, and she wasn't adopted till she was about. 16 and it's kind of like their version of adoption which is more so like foster care where they kind of pitched it the government being they uh pitched it to families of of uh sicily if you have a farm which a majority of sicily is agriculture Mm -hmm. uh, then um you can get a kid and we'll throw you some money and you have extra help on your farm (laughs) so that's kind of what happened with her uh then she met my grandfather along the way and they had an olive farm um and when they were in their mid-20s and had three children they uh, decided that it was time to leave sicily and come to america so my grandfather came first leaving my grandma with all three kids um and a farm to run by herself and then a year later she uh, joined him and so that's kind of where the name kind of came from was uh, paying homage to her very interesting very very cool you don't you don't hear many many stories behind a name or a brand that are like that so that's very unique um so tell tell us what the brand is what what do you folks do so we are a female driven uh hunting company uh so we make gear for women uh we are kind of unique in this space we've been in business for about two and a half years now Uh, So we have sizes ranging from extra, extra small to 3X, both in a regular and a curvy fit. So we're the first in the industry to bring that size range and that unique sizing structure. And we're also bringing fabrics and technologies from other industries into the hunting space to give uh, better performance and durability uh, while uh, women are in the field. Gotcha. So when you talk about... uh... If you, I, I understand the you know, the fit and everything, and and wanting to mm-hmm. make sure that this product is designed specifically for for women to have the best product mm-hmm. possible in the field, but when you start talking about the the fabrics and the materials that y'all are using, go into that a little bit for us and tell us a little bit about what makes your products different. So we do have, especially with our um, base layers, which you got to see at Hunter's Extravaganza, they're definitely different uh, than anything that's in the market. We use um, a recycled nylon and polyester with a hemp component that actually has its own patent. And um, that actually acts as when you blend everything together with the technology and how it's it's working is that it actually 
does temperature regulating. So it heats you up or cools you down instead of you having that base layer underneath. And sometimes you get hot during the day. I had a lot of women uh, when we did our customer discovery and spoke to our community that were like, I have to strip in the middle of the day. So like that doesn't work. Right. So it, it wicks you. It, it, it kind of acts like this um, really interesting like air conditioning component underneath your garment, and it also keeps you warm when it starts to you know temperatures start to switch and you start to get cold. So you can actually have it underneath you all day long mm-hmm. and not have to get undressed or change. And then when you're done with your hunt, you can take your stuff off and just have you know those on and be really comfortable. Uh, so that that's one thing that we're bringing. It also has lots of compression in it, and they're seamless, so it fits any body type. Type, which that's one of the big things that we're about is making sure that every size is covered in this industry. So being able to bring that seamless technology uh, into this space, we can actually kind of like blanket our size range and then some when we go to grow further. Gotcha. Very cool. So how long have y'all been working on this? Um, the base layers are everything in general. <laughs> the, the, the whole brand, putting all this together and getting you guys to the point that so you're at right now. About- so two and a half years. So we started two and a half years ago. Uh, my co-founder, Audrey Young, and I, uh, we were the, the two first co-founders. Um, we interviewed uh, hundreds of women in this space to see what they needed and what they wanted and what they didn't like and very in-depth conversations. Uh, we kind of feel like she's our best friend. We, we know what she eats for dinner. It's kind of like that. <laughs> we're, really, we're really that close with our customer. Um, so along the way, uh, we acquired uh, Summer Meyer, who has about 20 plus years of technical design experience in the tactical and outdoor world. Uh, so we kind of once we got her, it was kind of off to the races where she took all that data really, and it was the one that started you know, helping us create the product and and turning into what it is today. So two and a half years of work. Um, you know, we finally have actual product that dropped in the warehouse this year we had sales samples that we were doing pre-sales with and you know we have our base layers soon very soon we'll have our performance tops our quarter zips and then adding to that collection as well next year awesome Mm -hmm. so i'm I'm jumping around a little bit between product development and history i feel like but um what what made y'all want to do this because this is this is just a a huge thing to to jump in and do and and obviously as you mentioned two and a half years and 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 still moving forward it, it's a journey um but i mean we're you know you're talking a lot of a lot of research a lot of product development a lot of money um what what was the motivating factor between just driving this journey so it really started um with myself uh so I could probably back up and, and yeah, I've been in either, an, you know, upland hunting with my dad since I was probably about three, uh, you know, all the way to um, in the last like few years becoming a you know big game hunter. So stepping out of that upland and, and actually getting out more so in the field and being extremely frustrated with the gear that I had, you know, access to and nothing ever fit me right i'm i'm petite in the sense of i'm short i'm like barely five foot four when i say five foot four my whole team argues that i'm five foot four they're like (laughs) like five three and three fours but she rounds up um so like i'm really short and i have a short torso um and i'm also really curvy so what's out there for women's gear just it wasn't working i'd have to either use like my dad's hand-me-downs which uh, those never fit me correctly anyways and i've been doing that since i was a kid we've all been there we've all been we've there, all been there. <laughs> um so majority of my gear like one of my first times out was um was men's gear from like bass pro and i was still like pulling out my pants like crawl over logs and it, it was just it was such a pain that a couple years ago <laughs> two and a half almost three years ago now, um, I really sat down and thought about that and was like, I can't be the only woman in having this problem. And I knew a few other women that hunted. So actually starting to talk to them and really get introduced to other women that hunt, which turned into this whole spiral of interviewing and having this huge community of, you know, now 3000 plus women that we, that we talked to and gaining, um, that I'm not the only one out there that we all feel this way. And they're from the super petite woman all the way to the tall, uh, you know, curvy thin, you name it. It was just this huge problem that no one was really trying to address. And 
we really wanted to be, um, you know, I really wanted to be the person I, I had someone say, well, why not you? And I was like, why not me? So like, let's jump in and, and try it out. So I was um, very fortunate enough to have a girlfriend that started a business and I took her to lunch and kind of chatted with her about her process. And she introduced me to the CEO of One IE in Riverside, California. And One IE specializes in basically launching startups. They're kind of like this incubator accelerator. Um, I talked to their CEO and he was like, I'm, I'm on board. I'll come in, I'll be your chairman. I'll help you build a team. And then when I asked him why, like our biggest thing when anyone wants to join our team is why do you want to join our team? And he said, I'm an outdoorsman and I have a daughter. And that was pretty much enough for me to know that he understands the space and also understands her frustrations as well. Right. So um, once we started working with them and I worked with him to build out an in incredible team, there's more of us now. So that's really incredible. Um, yeah, It's been off to the races like ever, ever since. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So when you talk about developing and testing these products and, and, and getting that mm -hmm. journey going, I, I, I don't want you to give away any big secrets. If there are, <laughs> yeah. Anything crazy if there is, but what, what have been some of the, uh, on the flip side of it, what have been some of the hurdles and, and the big things that y'all have had to overcome? Um, obviously finding, uh, Factories that were willing to work with a really small brand mm -hmm. and to give us, you know, small minimum quantities to order. Um, we unfortunately and hopefully in the future we'll be able to do this. But when we started with the Sophia Adventure Pant, the technology that's all in that pant, along with the fabric that it's created with, there wasn't anyone on the U.S. side that knew how to work with that fabric. So we had to move it offshore to uh, Vietnam. However, our base layers, we were very fortunate with to find a factory in North Carolina that can make that to kind of start our, you know, our U.S. line. So mm -hmm. wanting to create things here was a little bit of a challenge. There's also the cost effect, right? So it's like if I make like the Sophia pant here, that Sophia pant was going to be like $400. And that was something we didn't want. We wanted it to be an attainable aspiration for women, not right. just like these are rad and but they're, you're going to be 400 deep. And, and then who's, you know, who's going to buy that. So uh, we really were looking at that average blue collar woman hunter that we wanted to ensure that we were giving her affordable gear, but not just affordable gear, affordable gear that can perform. Right. So yeah, those are, that was like some of the hurdles. Also, when you're building out your team, sometimes, um, you know, finding people the right fit, that that's always a challenge. So we've had a few, uh, we had a co-founder come and go, um, uh, we've had some teammates as well that, that we've lost along the way that just weren't, frankly, uh, working out over time. So there, there's that. Your team is extremely important. Um, one of the number one reasons why startups fail is because of the team. It's not because of the lack of funding. So the us as the three co-founders and our, our board, we now have a board of five board members that we report to. They understand that importance as well. Um, so us three original co-founders are very open and deep with each other with conversation to keep that going um, and then we also find amazing people that are that are out there that wanted to join our team that just meshed well yes. with us and really really understood you know our value prop and our mission so we've been you know fortunate with that um also you know timing and production as well because it takes a long time to make something so it can take up to a year so you have you know a few you know, six to eight weeks for fabric to be made. And then you have your whole process from there of a prototype and then adjusting the prototype, getting a sales sample and you're kind of messing with it once you get the sales sample, because that's when you really get to see what it, what it looks like and you still get to make some changes. Um, but the whole start from start to finish of a process of one of our gar garments takes, takes a year. So that's, you know, sometimes could be a little, a little taxing, but, um, once you know your roadmap and once you know the timing, if you time everything correctly, you know, it's, it goes pretty seamlessly sometimes. Um, and then we have logistics right now. Everyone is facing that at, at the time where you're told you're going to get your products in four weeks and like, you know, eight, nine weeks later, <laughs> things are dropping in your warehouse and you're like, cool, that was late. But luckily we have an amazing community that understands we're a startup and, and that, you know, there's hurdles right now to jump. And anytime we send an update out on what's going on with product, you know, we have 
haven't to this day, knock on wood, we haven't had someone ask for a refund. Everybody has been wow. very patient. Um, so it's been, it's been a really good experience so far. Very cool. Now, what, uh, what do you guys have or have coming soon as far as different camos or color options or, or, or what's the variety look like from that? Cause I know that plays a big part in, like you said, that production time and mm -hmm. you know, you're talking different fabrics and now different, potentially different colors, you know, where, yep. where, where's all that at? So right now you can get the Sophia, um, in our strata camo. We have a partnership with uh, true timber. They're amazing. Uh, we're going to add to that camo line. So we're, we're going to be getting Kanadi, which is kind of that woods, that woodsy uh, look that was actually requested by our um, our Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania girl, where she was like, "I love this, but I need this." And uh, so we, you know, we're pulling we're pulling that in. Um, so that's an extra camo that we're adding. Uh, maybe even a prairie. We're still kind of doing our discovery on that to see if that's what we're going to do. But we will also have um, black available. That's been a huge a huge color mm -hmm. ask. Has uh, has been black and a gray. Uh, so we'll be adding to that. And then um, our tops will also kind of reflect that that same. Uh, we've been asked for solids and camos. So we're, we're really trying to make sure that we bring bring those requests to market for, for her. Gotcha. Very cool. So what's the next? I, I know you said that you have some some upper layers and stuff that are mm -hmm. coming in in the very near future. And that's exciting. What what's the uh, excuse me, the next big hurdle or the next big uh thing that y'all have coming up uh aside from that um, in our product roadmap we're going to start working on young ladies so fitting that tween uh, that little tween area right now um she can fit into our extra extra small but we want to make sure that we're not just having someone that can fit an extra extra small but we can kind of cover that whole base so it's taking the uh, adult line and looking at how we're going to make that young that young ladies and then making sure that she needs all those features that are that are in there she may not need everything that's in there. So maybe paring it down or adding a few things to it uh, to meet her needs. Awesome. Well, this is, it's really cool. And, and I know, as you alluded to earlier, we met at the Trophy Hunter Extravaganza this yeah. past August and made that connection and have been working to, to get something worked out ever since and looking at outfitting some of our our ladies on our fall obsession staff now mm -hmm. to represent y'all's products and everything and help y'all out. Cause I think it's, I think it's such a, a cool thing that y'all are doing that not a lot of folks or uh, other brands are like, you can look at another, another camo company or, or clothing manufacturer and they might have a women's line, but y'all, the amount of research and time that y'all have put mm -hmm. into this is so much more in depth that I, I can only, mm -hmm. I can only imagine of, far superior product. And I know that's the goal. So. Yeah. And that research continues. So that's something that we don't stop. We don't stop talking to our community. We don't stop, you know, getting, getting that information to build that superior product, um, which it, it's important to us. It's important to be really close to her and, and also, um, you know, give her resources that, that she wants as well. Like we heard across the board, I don't know how many times other women wanted to meet other women. Like they love hunting with their families and they think it's great. And sometimes they go out by themselves to get a, you know, get a break from husbands and kids, but they want to have girls weekends. They want to have girls camping trips. They want to be able to plan a trip and go to Colorado and do elk hunting. And so we did develop a, a, a Facebook group community that's private and it is monitored to ensure that the people that are in there are, are safe and kind. And uh, we've had, I don't know how many women do meetups from there. And there's, there's over 3000 plus women and young ladies in there that have made friends and have gone on family camping trips together and really amazing things. Ask questions, lots of new hunters in there that are like, this is my first year. Here's where I'm at. What do you recommend? So lots of, you know, you know, gear questions, uh, how to get tags, where should I go? Uh, and then everybody pitches in and, you know, talks to them about that. And we kind of leave everyone alone. We let them do their thing. We do, we do monitor it to make sure that uh, nothing crazy is going on. And, and we do update on product and things like that, but it's, it's not really for a sales feature. It's right. really just to give them the space that they've asked for and that they've wanted. So we've provided that. That's very cool. The, mm -hmm. yeah, y'all, the, the fact that y'all are, are community driven 
behind mm-hmm. all of it as well yeah. is very yeah. is very encouraging to us because that 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 aligns with kind of our message and what we're trying to do on on our end as well because mm-hmm. you know we our our staff or programs for example we have all these folks across the country that represent us and contribute to our media production content and everything but um, at the same time there's there's an underlying family aspect of all that too and we have uh, in the last years we've or last year really we've gone to some pretty uh, some much more detailed structuring to try and give them as much resources locally to try and do those meetups and have that Mm -hmm. interaction everything and 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 on the ladies specifically, you know, I, I know on our podcast, if any of our listeners are returning and have listened to episodes recently, they'll know that we've had a lot of uh, ladies, some our own and some guests come on the podcast lately talking about, you know, some women in the hunting industry. And I, I don't think it was until we started having these guest after guest mm-hmm. after guest, some just some are just your everyday yeah. ladies who wouldn't have an outlet to share any information if we didn't have them on the podcast and others are are higher up in the hunting industry but anywhere in between all that there there's always this uh there's always been this level of just uh i I don't want to say frustration but um how do I get into it? How do I get into mm-hmm. hunting and, and, and what is there for me? You know, kind of a question mark, if you will. And so it's been really interesting to, um, to hear their perspectives and hear their journeys on how they got into hunting in the outdoors and how they have progressed through that as well. Um, because I don't think consciously for me, I was, I really realized the, the big hurdle that it is for some, you know, coming, coming into an industry like this. So. Yeah. It's, it's really incredible, especially, uh, you know, being, in the group personally and kind of watching and, and reading it and speaking to some of them as well. Um, I, where a lot of women and I kind of had, I don't, I don't want to say I have a biased opinion of this, but I grew, I grew up doing this. I was very fortunate enough to have a dad who, um, you know, I'm an only child had like no bias towards, you know, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you're a boy or a girl, like you're going to learn how to do these things. He had a reason. It, it was a great reason. Um, but, a lot of women that we were talking to said, like, I didn't get started till college. And that's when I met my now husband, you know, but at the time was my boyfriend, always had an interest in it, never had a family that hunted, but thought like it would be something good to do. And then met him and then he took her out for the first time. And then after that was like off to the races. Yeah. So a lot of women in their 20s you know, or even in their like 18, 19, um, getting off and starting off. My niece um, just started today. <laughs> so we took I told you we were taking her out. Yeah. Uh, earlier uh, this morning, so and she's 14, so uh, she just got her hunter safety. Um, we took her out there today. Uh, her dad had his rifle, and I had my bow, and she was like, "I kind of want to do what she does." I'm like, "We'll get there. Just <laughs> like let's baby baby step it up, and just kind of get her out there uh, for the first time." So you know, mentorship is huge, um, it, even in our own community. So it's really good to, that we built one. I'm, I'm really happy that we built one, and we get to provide women with that. Yeah, that 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 is very cool. Like I said, very very encouraging for us, especially with kind of our our awareness and drive that we've put some focus on here lately on our podcast mm-hmm. specifically. So very, very cool. So that, and that's kind of a, kind of a good segue as well. Cause I wanted to, to kind of transfer the, the second part of our conversation today over to you specifically and, um, how you got into hunting. And I know you just mentioned that it started when you were, when you were young with your dad and everything. And, um, but what what are what are your main hunting experiences growing up or or where don't have to give away your 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 secret hiding spots or anything but but where, where do you hunt <laughs> uh, so i i'm currently in uh southern california so uh, i live in norco right now i'm in um Phelan, california uh, at my mom's so this is where i grew up was the high desert of california um one day i'll leave i promise <laughs> <laughs> It's been a transitional year, so it's it's been a really it's been a really interesting year over here in the proto household. Um, so I grew up here in the desert of California, and like I said, primarily it was upland. So your pheasant, your quail, your dove. Um, my dad started me off at let's see, I was a bird dog for a while. Um, I think every kid starts off that way if their parent is an upland hunter. Yeah. So um, <laughs> you're a bird dog for a few years. <laughs> and I I think I'm trying to remember. I know my 
some of my early memories are more so of like fishing with my dad. Um, I was recently told that, that I was out in the woods before I could walk. My dad had this like red, like backpack. He would put me in like a backpacker's pack and just kind of like chop me around when he was, you know, glassing or scouting or, or anything like that. Um, but I think from the time I was like four, I was out there with the dog and, and my, or before the dog and my dad and being the dog, um, when we were seven is when we got a bird dog and, um, I, I was like, I really want to learn how to work the dog. He's like, cool, here's a quail call. And let me show you how to kind of do this. And so then my job became calling in the birds and working the dog. And he took me to class with him. So that way I could learn and run the dog in class. And it just became kind of like a second nature thing. Yeah. So um, that's kind of really how I got, I got started. And then he would take me with him. So I would work the dog, call in the birds. And as soon as I got old enough to do you know, hunter safety and all of that, then it was, okay, like, here's your shotgun, let's go, let's go, yeah. type of thing. So um, Upland for a very long time, I was also a competitive um, archer. So when I was nine is when I got my first bow and um, I competed a lot and I didn't, didn't hunt with it. It was mainly just competing in 3Ds and, and uh field uh, some indoor um and i still do that from time when i have time yeah. um from, from time to time once in a while i did a tournament last weekend and i think that was my first my first tournament all year long and that we're in you know wrapping up and going into november so that should tell you you know, how the <laughs> really i've been um but really uh, so i went to college and then kind of I don't want to say stop hunting, but it's just I was in school and and was trying to concentrate on that and and get a job, and and do those things and then um, really was kind of like contemplating doing big game, uh, and uh, then decided like you know I'm just gonna put in I'm gonna put in for a deer tag and and like see what happens. Yeah. So um, you know got two got two deer tags um, for our local mountain areas here um, in San Bernardino and LA area. Um, and that's County. That's not like going into LA city for people are like LA, but just the County, which branches off into a beautiful mountain range that, that we have over here in San Dimas area and then trickles off behind into the Wrightwood area, which is very close to where I grew up and where I'm sitting now. Um, so we hunt those areas, uh, also over to big bear, which is a really awesome place. My favorite place is, um, the Mojave national preserve, which is out in the middle of the desert in the middle of nowhere. And everyone's like, there's deer there. I'm like, there's big corn sheep there. There's deer, there's yeah. mountain lions. There's all kinds of cool stuff out there. But, um, at night it's pitch black, dark. You can't see your hand in front of your face. It's incredible. And the stars are just, it's like this blanket of Milky way. Um, it's hot <laughs> and really cold. So you get, you get a huge fluctuation in, in temperature. Yeah. Um, but it's like, the terrain is unbelievably hard. It looks like it's very easy until you get out and you start trucking up a mountain or something and you get a quarter of a way up and you're like, this was not a good idea. <laughs> we should have <laughs> not done this, but it, there's massive, massive gear out there and you have to be very careful um, and keep an eye on your onyx while you're out there or whatever map you use because you can easily trickle over into Arizona or Nevada. So we're kind of in like this little pocket that like sits against the state lines. Ah. Um, but yeah, that's so as far as areas of here, that's that's where I go. Um, I also go out to Kansas um, and, to, and also to um, Missouri. I do have friends out there, but I fly out and we do duck hunt i'm getting ready to do a pheasant hunt out there um so yeah i go fly out and meet up with the girls and you know have have a good time out there so that's awesome yeah. I, I uh i'm always amazed whenever on the rare occasion it seems for me personally that i get to talk with somebody who hunts or has hunted in california um because I, 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 I yeah <laughs> I, I, well i i know that there i know that there's it, it's different than than Texas mm -hmm. where I'm from for sure as far as you know yeah. licensing and tag goes and stuff but um it, it wasn't really until last year we we did a, a veteran giveaway uh hunt here in Texas and the and the veteran that we brought out here was from Northern California and had mm -hmm. hunted up there for that's where he got into hunting been hunting up there for almost a decade 
and it was just very interesting to learn from him like the hunting opportunities that are there yeah. in California or like you said you know deer or sheep or you know all these other things that are there because I, I know California is a very beautiful state but I, I just I don't think that uh, for those who aren't there they don't really ever think about the the wildlife aspect of of California so no they, they really really don't um it is pretty here it's it's very it's very very pretty here i'm very blessed to have mountains all of a 45 minute drive for me not a lot of people have that right. um a quick like six to eight hour drive i'm central to northern california um yeah and my ao tag is good in just about every area um during like general season which is rifle season uh, so if you know, I'm just with my bow, I can practically you know hunt the host the whole state if if I chose to do so. Um, this is my first year doing predator, so I have a bear tag. I'll be going out in a couple of weeks with awesome. um, some of my dad's friends. So um, that's <laughs> gonna be interesting. Never never done bear before. Um, but we also almost lost our bear season this year too, just due to yeah. you know. Yeah, I heard about and, that. Yeah, so it was a uh, luckily um, there's a lot of organizations, one of which I'm part of, which is CBH, where our legislation committee and other organizations' legislation committees got together and you know on the phone and basically pleaded our case on why you know we we do need the bear season and um, why the science behind that is actually correct, not incorrect, mm. as others were stating. And um, we kind of won that battle. So yeah. we do keep a close eye on legislation going around here and in Washington uh, to, you know, protect, you know, everyone's rights, not just Archer's rights, but also you know, your firemen as well. Yeah. Yeah. Not to not to make it, a you know, about politics or conservation mm -hmm. or anything like that. But I, I am very grateful for organizations that uh, mm -hmm. that that monitor that kind of stuff and are ready to step up to the plate when needed for to protect those hunters and in conservation rights and all that kind of stuff so and and i'll i'll leave it at that for now but we for our listeners yeah. uh, we are looking at a we are about to have some content on our on our pages more specifically about that and i'm looking forward to being a part of that so more to come yeah. on that from fall obsession at least but <laughs> so what uh as we kind of near head toward the end of our time here, what are some of your uh, more memorable hunts that stand out throughout the course of your life? Oh gosh. Um, your first year is always rad. That's yeah. always like the best. Um, and in California, it's not easy to get a deer. Oh, no. People are wondering why I harvested a deer at the age of 40. Um uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, 39, um, because it, it's hard. Um, so um, that definitely, definitely was uh, an, incre an incredible moment. Uh, I shared it with my dad. So that was, you know, um, unbelievable. I, I lost him this year. So I lost my dad this year. So obviously, just about every memory I have is extremely special because yeah. it's, it, you know, anything that, that revolves around him, of course. Uh, so... Yeah, my my buck up in Vincent's Gulch was an an incredible experience. Um, it also taught me the um, importance of shot placement with my bow, um, and how everything can change in an instant. I had like the perfect shot, and as I released, he stepped forward, so it ended up being a gut shot instead of that you know heart lung shot that you really want. Right. Uh, and then an all day chase, which yep. was just. Um, just so heart wrenching for me because I don't, you know, no, none of us want them to suffer, obviously. Um, so let's just say after that, I was very, very, very diligent about thinking and planning ahead for just about any, any type of, you know, something that goes wrong. Um, not that that it went wrong. It's just, it was a longer, it, it took longer than it should have is kind of how I felt. And I couldn't, yeah. couldn't get an extra shot on him because every, he was running ridges like crazy. He definitely gave me a run for my money for sure. And anytime I could stop and try something was in the way of a bush or, or a, you know, a rock or something. Um, and by the end of the day, we had to just like leave him overnight, which I was, terrified of doing it because you think about everything i was like what if a coyote gets him what if a bear gets him it was just this whole thing a very sleepless night yeah 
<laughs> you're just laying there, um, hoping that when you come back that that they're that they're there. Um, so luckily the next morning when we went up, like he definitely he was right where we left him. So that was a, a good thing. But also, yeah, like I said, um, an experience alone where I was like, gotta work on shot placement. Good to know. Yeah. Uh, so that that was a really fun one. Um, and I've also had great hunts where you don't harvest anything at all. And you just have the best time. Um, I had great time with the girls uh, from Wilderness last year and Kansas when we went on our duck hunt. Didn't get a damn thing, but it was just the best time at the blinds and snacks were flowing. And it, you know, it was just it was just great just to sit there and and, and just uh, camaraderie with with one another. Um, those are those are always those are always fun. The best the best moments around the campfire, obviously, and yeah, yeah. And duck blinds are good. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, I'm glad those last two scenarios or stories that you share that 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 you did share them because one is unfortunate as you know a, a prolonged pursuit of an animal like that, especially an overnight one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> can be, and how how just uh, I, I I always tell folks you have never hunted unless you have felt that gut wrenching feeling inside, you know, that's, oh, yeah. that's just, that, uh, that's an unfortunate part yeah. of it. And we doesn't matter who you are or where you hunt. We've all been there. It's, it's mm-hmm. just, like I said, it's, it's part of it. So I, I I'm grateful mm-hmm. for you, for you sharing it because not a lot of people are hesitant to share experiences. No, like that, it's but a, you learn from it. So to dig more into it. Like I released my arrow, like at seven 30 and we didn't back off of him until and now we did give him time, so don't think it was like a from seven thirty on. Like that's what we did. No, we backed off. We in between giving him like another thirty minutes, another forty five, an hour. Like we did do that, but we didn't back off the mountain until like four o'clock in the afternoon. And the only reason why we did that is because the sun was starting to set. There was snow. It was cold. Um, I was like sitting there, like just starting to shiver, and and I was literally just sitting there with my gla- my binoculars on my face for probably a good hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, just watching him. And he finally bedded down and he was standing there. You know, we, we were like, he's contemplating over uh, the next ridge. And if he goes over the next ridge, like I'm going to lose him. Cause yeah. we just knew with daytime, you know, the daylight was running out. Um, and I think it's important to share those too. Not everything is perfect. You can plan everything out to the T and be extremely experienced and it still happens. Um, I cried in the car and my dad was like, stop crying. You know what this is about. But then he felt awful. Like when we got home, cause he was like, you're upset because you were like, what if I just wounded him? And it's like, exactly. Like, what if that's what all it was? And I couldn't get another shot off. So that's, you know, I mean, it's emotional and, got, and it's just, it's awful. Um, the celebration is wonderful, yeah. <laughs> but you still, yeah, it, there's so there's there's all that. It's very emotional, and I think people that don't understand hunting don't understand that. Where it's we're not just out there just for blood, guts, and glory. It we're we're feeding our families. It, it's important to us, and, and we honor that animal. We, we respect it, and we don't want it to suffer. It's you know why we why we prepare the way we prepare to you know to get out there. Yeah, it it is it's 100 percent the word emotional is very appropriate it's 100 percent a a emotional um connection between hunter and animal in in that in that extent it's yeah it's i think the coolest thing was and this brought a lot of things into perspective is that when we were the next morning like walking up to the deer my dad kind of kicked back and he was like go like approach him like go up to him and i like kneeled down and he's like run your hands through him and so I like did that and was like touching his antlers. He's like, you are the first person to touch that animal. Yeah. And it's like, you're just like, wow, like that's, it, it dawns on you right then and there. Like, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. You, it, 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 it's definitely, yeah. If you don't stop and think about those things, you just, I, I don't know, so much is lost. You you have to. And then if, if people mm-hmm. don't, they they ain't doing it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I took my son uh, for the first time. Um, he's nine of scouting with me a, a few weeks ago. Um, and 
he got a little too loud, <laughs> which kids do. But it was just a, you know, well, he's loud in general. He's a boy. They make a noise. <laughs> yep. Very similar. Uh, but um, I, he spotted um, a doe and two fawn before I did. And he got all excited. And I was like, calm down. Like, what do you see? And he's like, there's a mommy with two babies. And I'm like, mm, okay. And I kind of glassed over there. I was like, oh, crap. Like, yeah, I was like, I'm proud of you. That's, you know, that's a big find. So, yeah. you know, so quickly in him learning, like how, how to use his binoculars, um, you know, and, and whatnot. But um, I'll, I'm going to try to take him out. Let's see. We'll see what happens. But the, the, the scouting is like good because <laughs> you don't have to worry about taking another hunter off or blowing your cover yeah. um, <laughs> off a little with you. Uh, but I, re- I remember like, oh God, like my first quail, my first dove where my dad was like, go pick it up and like hold it and, and touch it. And I, you know, I plan to do the same thing um, with him and he, he's already ready to uh, you know, he really wants to go, wants to go bird hunting, but, um, he'll be a dog for a while. So <laughs> it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Got to uh, keep, got to start where everybody else started. I started that way. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So passing it on, it, you know, it's, it's important. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and I love what you said too, about the, you know, some of the most memorable hunts are, are the hunts where you don't kill anything. I 100% agree. One, one of my top experiences is just that it's, 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 it was in Montana and it's just, it was, I ate a tag sandwich, but I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't trade the week I was up there for the world. It was amazing. So I no, that, that was agree. definitely last season, um, with my dad, which was probably our funnest. Um, and we were out in the Mojave national preserve, which is also known for a D 17. If anyone is from California wondering where in the hell I'm talking about, it's, it's D 17 on the map um and we decided to hike up it's called new york mountain and um it was my idea and apparently it wasn't the best one <laughs> because i was told about a quarter of a way up uh I turned around and i got the this wasn't a good idea i'm like oh sorry uh, but just terrain just full of cactus and it's like don't fall you're gonna fall into cactus it, it, i probably should have thought it out a lot better i'll, I'll be honest with you <laughs> but um but we we made it it took us a while uh, but we got to the top and it was just gorgeous, just juniper trees, just throughout like, the whole, the whole desert. And it, it was, it was phenomenal. I didn't get a damn thing that week, but you know, it, it was, it was just, we hunted hard. I think probably the hardest, um, we've hunted in a while. Um, but yeah, like it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't matter to me. And I was told this too, getting ready to go on this bear hunt. Like, I can't guarantee you anything, but I've got a spy and there's an activity. So I'm just going to like drop you off there and <laughs> hope the best you know, type of thing. But, um, it, and I, I said it, you know, to, um, my dad's friend, Brad, I was like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What matters is we just have a good time. Yeah. Like that's really all that matters to me is that we, we have a good time. Yes. I would love to harvest something and bring it home. And, and that's great. I love to fill my freezer but it's not guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I got two more questions for you yeah. before we, uh, before we wrap it up and, and these questions about the, the favorite memories and these last two, they're questions we ask mm-hmm. every, every first time guest on our podcast. Okay. But, um, what are some of your top bucket list hunts that you haven't gotten to do yet? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I want to do a snow goose hunt, and I was just invited on one, and I had a decline. So that was, like, heart-wrenching of, like, oh, I won't be able to make it. But it was, like, want to do this? Like, I can't. It's either one or the other, and I already had one already planned. So you yeah. say that. I, I guarantee you our, <gasps> our staff manager, Todd, he, <laughs> he listens to every podcast. I'm sure his wheels are turning right now because we're, we're doing a snow goose hunt in the spring. So if – Okay. We'll, we'll we'll talk later. So. Okay. If, yeah. If, we'll if talk you're interested. Later. So. If it doesn't interfere with a show, then we should be. We have a jam packed show schedule um, for spring. So um, if it doesn't interfere, I'm in. I, I'm in. Uh, that's kind of why I had to say no to this one. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I already had something planned for December, and I was like, I can't do both. It just it's not gonna work out. Um. So definitely snow goose. Uh, elk is one of that I think everybody wants if they haven't done it yet. Uh, and I unfortunately just didn't have, um, well, I didn't pull an elk tag here in California. So that was disappointing. Uh, but just 
didn't have the time to plan to do do something in Colorado or or, or right. any other place this year because we've been been um a little a little busy yeah um <laughs> to say the least um but um if I oh, if I had a chance to pick anything I would probably say moose in Alaska would be rad and I'll, I will be toting around a fly rod with me on that as well so um yeah those would probably be the top top three right now that's uh those are i won't bore you and rattle off like the rest but well <laughs> no, <laughs> every, everybody uh, everybody asked the question to nine times out of ten their reaction is just what yours was oh there's so many you know oh, and, so and many. yeah there's i mean every hunter's a dreamer so it, it it's oh yeah. you know, it's always looking for the next adventure or or, or what's next so yeah. and and oftentimes <laughs> sometimes uh i'll use our our marketing director drew as an example he uh he had a bucket list hunt of an axis deer. He's from Minnesota and he wanted mm. to kill an axis deer down here in Texas or in the South somewhere. And this past summer he, he shot his axis. He got to go on his hunt and, and fulfill that dream. And I asked him, I was like, so how's it feel to fill your, your bucket list out? And he's like, I don't know if I checked one off or I just added another thing I'm going to have to go back and do again. So yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. We, we have a, we're very fortunate enough. Our marketing board member, um, her, her and her husband own, um, an outfitter out in South Africa. And the first, like the, one of the first things she said was, would you, would you ladies like to come to it? She couldn't even get it out. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. Is my answer. <laughs> when is the question? But yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it just it just adds like you can't. Mm. Yep. It's just another obsession for sure. I know. All right, so my last question is, is one that I've uh, I've asked several ladies here within recent episodes and everything, but what mm -hmm. uh, it's always advice related, and I'll ask what what big piece of advice do you have for ladies out there who are wanting to get into hunting more mm -hmm. or get into the outdoors more and just. Uh, just don't really don't really know what what that next what that next step is what that big jump is if that makes sense um yeah i won't plug our facebook group but if you want to it's called uh women who hunt and it has like the Nutelli logo on it it's, and uh but get into some facebook groups women are dying to help other women uh, grow in this community and ask all the questions you can ask. No question is dumb. The one you don't ask is dumb is kind of how I put it. Yep. Someone is willing to help you. Uh, if you're uncomfortable asking a gentleman, you know, ask your fellow woman, they, they will help you. I promise, promise, promise you. We are a kind community and we just, we just want to bring more women into the sport and, and nourish them. Um, I also have, and you'll build your own little community, which is, which is great. And I have my own, I have gentlemen, I can ask questions, you know, too. Um, and YouTube is a great resource if you want to learn how to fletch your own arrows or, or questions about gear. Uh, there are also, you know, amazing women online that you can follow too, that are more than happy to answer questions um, as, you know, as well, whether it's on, you know, um, Instagram um, or, yeah, or on Facebook. Um, I, I'll say on Instagram, uh, Pink Shares, she's one of them, uh, Shrenda Burt. She will answer whatever question you have under the sun, including myself. So you're more than welcome to find me and ask me, but get into Facebook groups. There's so many of them on on Facebook that are, are kind and wonderful and they just want you to succeed. So they'll help you in any, in any way that they can. I, I promise you that. And if they're local, if you find someone that's local to you, they will, they will meet up with you and, and help you out. Um, also I will kind of follow it up with, um, if you want to do firearms and you're not like, you have no experience with that. There's ranges out there that give incredible classes. Some of them are women driven as well, or you can do private lessons if you're more comfortable with that. Um, if you're more comfortable learning from a woman, ask them if they have you know, a woman instructor that's willing to to show you how to work your rifle, how to work your shotgun. Uh, you know, they, they're all out there. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Well, before we, before we conclude and I give my closing spiel, um, tell folks how they can find you or the company, where they can order, all that kind of stuff. All the fun stuff? Yeah. Um, you can find me personally on Instagram at Artemis Takes Aim. Uh, and you can find Detelli 
um, on Instagram at Totelli Outdoors. We're also on Facebook uh, at Totelli Outdoors. And you can go to DotelliOutdoors.com to check out, uh, you know, the company and our gear and, you know, what we have coming up. Awesome. Perfect. Well, folks, make sure that you guys go check them out, follow them on social media and uh, the incredible journey that they're going on right now. Um, And then for us at Fall Obsession, as we wrap it up, if you haven't already, whatever podcast platform you're streaming on, hit that follow and subscribe button. We're on all major podcast platforms. We also are streaming on Carbon TV and Waypoint TV now. Um, So be sure you go check us out on there. Our podcast videos are on our YouTube channel, and we drop multiple new uh, YouTube videos a week on there, not just our podcast, but also educational content and some of our other uh, hunting and media series. Um, Texas Dirt is another one of those that's near and dear to my heart. That's our whitetail management series that we're filming right now down here in Texas. Mm-hmm. We're filming season two. Um, so that's on YouTube and Carbon TV as well. You guys can stream it on there. Social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Go Wild. Go follow us on those platforms. Um, check us out online at fallobsession.com. That's where you can find all of our um, hunting and outdoor content, our video series, educational articles, gear reviews, Wild Game Recipes podcast, all that kind of stuff. Hunting season is here. The weather's getting colder. Mm -hmm. I'm rocking our uh, blackout hoodie on the podcast video here, and our beanies are also available on our store right now. So be sure you head on over and get get some warmer fall obsession gear if you haven't already. And uh, last but not least, Ridge Rock Hunt Company is the podcast partner. Derek and Lacey over there in Mississippi, they uh, run an awesome service booking hunts with vetted and trusted outfitters across the country. Derek is one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet, and he works with hunters to find something that works for them in their budget, in their timeline, all that good stuff. So head on over and check out Ridge Rock Hunt Company if you want some help booking your next adventure with a trusted outfitter. So, Raylene, thank you again. I'm excited to see where the brand goes. Excited to be working with you guys and partnering with you guys, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be seeing you back on the podcast as well at some point in the near future. So That'd be great. All right, guys, thank you all for listening, and we'll be back again next Monday for another Fall Obsession podcast episode. We will catch you then.